Hey, Doug. Good morning. Hello. Let me just get set up here. I have a quick question for you. Uh, I want to. I'm switching companies. Uh, how do I do that with CNCF or leave this group in terms of affiliation? Um, basically, from my perspective, it just tell me and I'll switch it. Um, I'll just move you in the spreadsheet, and uh, that's about it. Um, okay. You want me to send you an email, or is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah, email or Slack or just something. Yeah. Just okay. All right. I'll do that afterwards. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the interop stuff, uh, we're doing demos at the end of the month. Is that right? We are hoping. Okay. Uh, well, I have next week off, so I'm actually going to take a few days and just try to plug it through and get something set up. I just wanted to double check my timing in terms of where things are going to be set up. And that helps. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Let's see. Um, yeah, end of March. And then hopefully maybe by KubeCon, we'll actually have a demo. Or we're going to start end of March. So yeah, you're right. Okay, perfect. That works out. Thank you. Cool. That'd be exciting. I know everybody has been wanting to find time to do stuff. It's just nobody seems to be able to find it. So, well, I have a week off, so it gives me some time to uh, get caught up again. And it's kind <laughs> of fun. It's actually kind of fun in a lot of ways. So I, I miss doing it. Yeah, that'd be good. All right. I'm, I apologize, David. I can't remember. Where do you work right now? I work for Splunk. And where are you going to? Are you, are you allowed to say? Uh, a company called Sentinel One. What do they do? I'm not sure I've heard of them. Uh, uh, cybersecurity endpoint. Most of, oh. their work, most of their work is actually in serverless space. Oh, cool. Uh, but they do endpoint security, mostly cloud-focused serverless. All their apps are serverless. So uh, when I go there, one of the things that... Um, I don't start for another week and a half or so, but one of the things that we'll end up doing is uh, trying to roll over into doing an integration with this project. Excellent. That sounds cool. I'm hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I've never actually done it because I've worked for IBM since I came out of college, but I can imagine the the prospect of switching companies, it's like, I can imagine it going both ways. It could be really, really exciting if you want to get the hell out of there, or it could be really, really scary. It's both. I've uh, been at several different companies, and uh, each place I've been at, um, the culture, how they operate things is completely different. And uh, uh, you experience both, uh, to be honest. Uh, some cases, it's like, wow, I love it. This is the best thing I've ever done. And in other cases, it's you're like, what the, <laughs> you know, what did I miss? You know, I don't want to see how I missed this beforehand. And it really depends. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, and uh, IBM, that's a long time, by the way. Which is, is, awesome. is a very long time, yes. <laughs> I won't tell you exactly how many, but yes, it's been a while. <laughs> um, all right, let's see who's on. Uh, Eric, are you there? Eric? I think you haven't told their mic. Yo, Tommy. Yo. Yo. Uh, Lucas. Here. Hello. And Ginger. Sorry, couldn't get my mute button fast enough. No, I'm here. Hey. hey. Eric, is your mic fixed yet? It should be. Yeah, yeah there we go. In case I decide to try to make you uh, speak up on the call. I tried reading through your latest uh, comment on that issue you opened, Eric, uh, last night. I, I unfortunately I, I couldn't make it through it all. I I had to save it for another day. That was a big comment. Well, uh, then maybe we don't have to talk about it today. Well, no, I, I, well no, actually, I, I didn't add it to the agenda, but if you want me to, I can. You know. <laughs> no, I think you are a wise man. <laughs> Well, I was also really, really tired. And it was late at night, so I don't, don't, don't read too much into that. 
All right. Uh, how are you there? Yep. All um, right. And hey, John, thanks for making it. My pleasure. All right. And we have the other Lucas. Hey, Lucas. Hi. Hey, Timur. Hey, Doug. Hello. Oh, hey, Clemens. I saw you pushing stuff today. That was pretty exciting. Uh, yes, I did. I, I went and uh, dealt with the uh, with one of my very, very long standing AIs. Yeah. But which means I haven't done anything on the newer AIs, but such is life. Yeah. So as I was preparing for the meeting uh, yesterday, I went through and found some issues that I thought were worthy of discussion. Obviously, this was just my take on it. If anybody on the call has a different set of issues they'd like to add to the list, just let me know. We can add them before or after in the middle. It doesn't matter where they go. But I don't want you guys to think that you're stuck talking about the ones that I thought were interesting. I just didn't want to have it be too short of a phone call. All right, let's see. Uh, Lance, you there. Yes, hello, I'm here. Hey. So while we're waiting, I know Clemens felt nagged sufficiently since he was working on his stuff. Lance, any chance of you fixing up that one PR that you have uh, outstanding? No, every week I think, oh, I need to do that and I have yet <laughs> to do it. So um, I'm, I'm writing it down in my little notebook right now. All right, oh, in the notebook, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I did my job, I nagged, okay. Hey, Manuel. Hi. Hey. All right, just one more minute, then we'll get started. Somebody came flying in. Who was that? Oh, no. Daniel. Hello. Hello. Oh, misspelled that. Come on. One more. Hi. Who's that? Oh, Christoph. Hey. Hey. All right, three after when we go in and get started. Um, just to let you know, I know last week we talked about what to do about the whole branch GitHub situation. And I didn't hear any objections uh, to doing Clement's suggestion of just merging everything into 101 branch, um, as long as they're you know strictly typos type stuff. Um, and Lance, I did see your comment and I, I interpreted your comment um, as basically saying, that's fine, just let's make sure we document it. Did I interpret that correctly? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we just, I think there should just be some guidelines on what is minor and can just go in and what, what isn't. Yeah, you know? okay. Okay, well, I took from that to, to give myself another AI to open up a PR to update our our process doc, if whatever it is, to make sure we include that. And I'll try to include in there the definition of, you know, what's worthy of being merged that versus forcing us to go to a 102. Okay, and then you guys can review that. Um, but barring that, I will later today go in and merge uh, the PR that caused me to even think about this, which is strictly a typographical type change. Okay, um, community time. Anything from the community people wanna bring up? All right, in that case, uh, SDK call will be next week. This week we have interop call. I, um, I'll double check, but I don't think we have anything on the agenda. So I suspect it's more just a nagging reminder to everybody um, to work on their code. I guess we don't even have an agenda thing in here. 
but we will at least have like a one minute phone call after this one to see if there's anybody has any topics they'd like to bring up. So hang on for that if you're interested. And just a little reminder, uh, end of March is when we're planning on st starting the interop and we are already in March. So the pressure's on all of us. Okay, now team we're offline reported in, he has nothing to report for the workflow stuff. So we can keep going, unless anybody has any questions on that. Okay, KubeCon EU. I got a note, I believe last week, asking what we want to do um, at KubeCon EU relative to office hours or booth or both. Does anybody have any opinion? I'm inclined to go more for office hours because I'm not sure we have, people have the free time to, to hang out at a booth for extended periods of time, but I wanted to ask the group what you guys thought. Any opinions at all? Okay, any objection then with me going with just office hours? And then we can figure out the, the scheduling of that later. Okay, not hearing objection, we'll go for that. Okay, before we jump into the meat of the agenda, meaning PRs and issues, any other topic people wanna to bring up? Okay. In that case, let's get into it. All right. Um, so this one technically affects the SDK folks more than anybody else. However, I did want to draw it to people's attention if, in case somebody else is interested. Um, somebody pinged me offline and it said they're thinking about um, uh, offering up code for another SDK. And of course, that's great. Um, but then I realized that we didn't really have anything in our governance stock to describe the process for adding new SDKs, because it seemed reasonable to me that if the SDK maintainers had the authority to vote on when to archive a project, when to get rid of it or make changes, they should actually have a say in adding new ones as opposed to just blindly accepting everything that comes, comes our way. So I just added a new section here that basically says the maintainers get to vote on it. It's a one week vote at least two thirds of them have to approve it, which is the same bar as all the other votes they have, I believe. And all SDK maintainers get to vote. Basically it's the same pattern as all the other votes they have, okay? Is there um, an implication, <coughs> sorry, that the, the list of initial maintainers on line 18, that they become new maintainers? I have to admit, this is something, I should have read this document uh, a lot being an SDK maintainer, um, <laughs> but I haven't. Um, so it may be covered from line 34 onwards already, but it feels like if a new SDK is typically because you've got some new folks coming in saying, hey, we've done this thing that we would like to contribute, then they should probably become new maintainers at the same time. Yeah, that was what I kind of implied by this. If you think there's a different wording here that makes it more clear, go ahead and suggest it. I don't, I don't mind changing that, but that's what I implied. That's, that's by line Just checking that I'd interpreted it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, but if, yeah, if, if, if you think it's unclear, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it offline and see if I can come up with better wording, but that was my intent, yes. Okay, now we don't, I mean, obviously you guys, if you, anybody on this call here has a problem with this, you know, speak up now or comment on the issue. But like I said, this was mainly for the SDK folks to, to review and vote on, but just wanted to bring it to people's attention. Okay, any other questions or comments or concerns about this? So Doug, they, they, you know, since, since I brought this up to you, Mm -hmm. um, we were intending to not open source the, the library and then move it, but go direct to cloud events, you know, just for ease, ease of uh, making it open source and just doing it once. There's nothing here that implies that there's a review of the SDK. So I wanted to just beg that question to the group to see whether there is a need for uh, that, that initial review of it before uh, a vote is taken, because you don't you don't explicitly state that. That's true. You and just to be clear, you're talking about uh, they might you may want to have them review the code itself to see whether it's worthy. Well, I, I again, I'm so <laughs> taking a step back from my selfish uh, wanting to open source this SDK. Uh, you know, I have to think about. Is that a requirement or is it not a requirement? Yeah, so I'll let other people speak up, but my, my take on it is I don't think it should be a requirement because technically someone can come here with no code at all and say, hey, I wanna do a, a C1, right? And, and 
the SDK maintainers should be able to say yes or no. <clears throat> and if they say yes, it's perfectly acceptable for them to start with a clean slate and they're the only maintainers. So they should be able to add whatever they want at that point. So it seems weird that if you're coming with code, we're gonna raise the bar and say, no, we're gonna review your code first as opposed to somebody who has no code who gets a low bar of just, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that's a good point. But that's just my view. Anybody else wanna chime in on Mark's point? Okay. Um, in that case, obviously, like I said, just go and review it if anybody has a chance. I believe the voting period for this will end, do, 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 closes on Monday at 3.30 3 Eastern. So uh, if you are a maintainer, please vote on this because we need at least two thirds of the people. Actually, no, I'm sorry. We don't need two thirds of the maintainers to vote, but we do need at least uh, hopefully more than just one person, which I think is Scott right now, so, okay. There, there, there are some questions in chat. Oh, here, and here you go. Anybody in the SDK team want to try to answer those? I can speak, but I'm not an SDK maintainer or even developer, so I, my, my opinion doesn't matter. Scott, Lance, anybody else? Go ahead. I would be astonished if there were currently any sort of um, organized release around, you know, lots of languages releasing at the same time. Um, until we've got something past 1.0, uh, it's going to be hard to know, you know, what would be in a 1.1, what would be in a 2.0, they're going to, uh, that will affect how releases need to happen. Um, because until we hit 1.0, it sort of didn't matter as much. Um, so I think we'll probably need to define this more as we go along, but I'm unaware um, of anything organized at the moment. Yeah, I think the answer to the first one is no, we don't have it. Every SDK does their own thing. And dealing with things being behind, it depends on how what the behind means, right? If they're just slow, we don't have anything to talk about that. If they're basically uh, appear to be dead, we do have a process in this SDK governance doc that talks about archiving projects or projects that become stale and and shifting maintainers to someone else if someone wants to take it over that kind of stuff. We do have some governance around that, but if they're just slow, we don't have anything for that. Okay. I was going to say, um, there, you know, it's best effort. It's all open source. It's not like the, these are products. This is all, you know, on people's own time or you know, managing their company time on open source pieces. So it's best effort. Yep. Good point. All right. Anything else about the SDK change? All right, moving forward. Do, 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 do. Slinky, are you on? No, he's not. I did notice that there's a whole bunch of activity going on there. And in fact, I know there was some discussions even today, so I suspect it's not ready to merge. Um, but without Slinky on, I can't know for sure. But does anybody have any comments or questions on here? Because um, I think if by next Thursday, if the amount of changes that have gone in have Trick had slowed down to a very slow trickle or even stopped. I'm inclined to merge it and, and say that's the first rough draft, and then we can iterate on it going forward. Does anybody see any concern with that as a high level plan? That seems reasonable. Okay, thank you, Clemens. Since, no, nothing, is fin since nothing, nothing is final until we declare a version, exactly. Um, I think it's okay. Yeah, my, my bar on this kind of thing is is it more right than wrong? So, yeah. And since it's just an extension, tech, well, technically an extension, an optional thing, yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? Okay. In that case, doo -doo -doo, let's move on then. All right, into the issues. I don't remember what this one was. Oh, yes. Um, who was this? Cedric. So here, I'll let you, I'll let you read the question. Okay, so there was a little bit of discussion about this. Um, and I believe, you don't have time to read all of it here, but I believe most people 
seem to be leaning towards saying that the answer is to, 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 to use the type field and not the schema field. I wanted, but I wanted to get the opinion of the group here in terms of whether that's the right solution or not. Because, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, a lot of the comments there are mine and I'm uh, somewhat nervous that I may have biased the conversation too much. Um, <laughs> but my thinking is that the schema URL is something that you consume whereas the type is something you're likely to use when you're subscribing. So you yes. could say, I want to subscribe to V1 or subscribe to V2, but you, you're unlikely to say, I want to subscribe to this schema. So if you're going to support both V1 and V2 at the same time, it makes sense for that to be in the type so that the consumer can choose which version they get. Um, whereas if you're just um, forcing everyone to keep up with you, then maybe schema URL makes more sense. Does that chime with how other people think about things. I, th I think that's actually very much aligned with that comment I made at the bottom there, right? Let me see if I can find Because I think I said something similar where I said, you know, basically if you want to support V1 and V2, then I agree with you. you the person should choose which type they want to get. But that's not to say you couldn't always keep a static type and change your schema because, at that, because you're going to force everybody to change over at that exact moment in time. You're not supporting multiple versions. Yeah. yeah. I think from a from semantics versioning uh, um, model, I think if you have a breaking change in the data, then then you need to have a way to um, distinguish that at the subscription at the subscription level. Um, if you but if you're just evolving, like if you if you're starting to add more and more information to um, the to the payload without breaking the semantics of the of, of what you're delivering then um, then sticking then sticking with the existing uh, um, uh, version of the of the event type may, may make sense so I think if you really have a, a new if you have really have a new payload where you just made changes then then indicating it, and, and then indicating knowledge about wanting that new payload with the with the, the 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 type the type that will make sense. So I think it's both. Yeah. I guess the real question for me is, and it, it's not, this is good. It sounds like we're all kind of heading in the same general direction. The question is, does anybody think we need to provide guidance in the primer? Mm. Or do you think it's obvious that we don't need to do it? And this question, and then, and Cedric was is just more of a one-off question kind of a thing. I personally, I would say guidance would be useful if we provide guidance. We're likely yeah. to get roughly consistent behavior across many providers. If yeah. we don't, I suspect it will be like rest URLs and things where there are as many different versioning schemes as there are um, providers. Right. Yeah. I, I, uh, guidance is never guidance never hurts. Um, well, and it's not normative, and so therefore everybody has can have their own their own um, variations of it. But giving sending sending those people into into a direction who have no concept of what they should do here um, that that certainly makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I, I I agree. I just want to make sure I wasn't alone in that. So then, in the spirit of no good deed goes unpunished, John, I'm wondering since you did speak up on this one a lot, would you be willing to take a pass at trying to create a PR for the primer? Um, <laughs> I will. I will take an action item to try to do it. Um, like probably everyone else on this call, I have many many things on, but um, <laughs> not least I've got Ecmacy Sharp stuff. <laughs> Standardization's fun. Um, I will see what I can do. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, hold on a second. I'm doing, taking some notes here. Got it. All right, cool. Thank you very much for that. All right, good discussion. Um, okay, this one. I'll let everybody read the question. And there were two comments here. John, you, you spoke up on this one as well. And, I, and I, your comment made sense to me, but I did ping Jem offline asking him to double check since he was the main author of the latest version of the proto spec. 
does everybody else concur that basically, I think you're saying, John, no change needed? Yes, indeed. I'm actually hoping to implement a protobuf event formatter in the C-sharp SDK as a separate package fairly soon, mostly to sort of prove that our event formatter abstraction is appropriate. Um, so I have looked at the proto quite recently and thought, yeah, that all makes sense. Okay, cool. Does anybody disagree with, with John there that everything's okay as is? Okay, in that case, I will go ahead and close that one later. I don't need to do it now. Oops, can't type. All right, cool. Thank you, everybody. Do, do, do. All right, John, would you like to introduce this one? You've been busy. Yes. Uh, sorry, I <laughs> didn't intend to make this meeting all about me. No, that's um, okay. It's all good. <laughs> so I've been busily at work on a new major version of the C-sharp SDK, and so kind of revisiting quite a lot of the decisions uh and implementation bits and part of that is http headers and so i've been looking at the spec and trying to work out if i'm going to be absolutely rigorous i want to be spot on with the spec and i found i i couldn't understand it clearly enough to know what to expect so i guess the simplest question is uh, about halfway down that comment if you've got an attribute value of that xyz colon abc what would that look like in an HTTP, HTTP header? Should the colons and slashes be escaped or not? Um, you know, if they were being deemed as URIs, then maybe the first colon wouldn't be and other ones might be, I'm not entirely sure. Um, basically, we have a, a mismatch because the URI RFC uh, 3986 um, talks about this bit of the URI needs encoding, this bit doesn't. We don't have URIs, not always at least. Um, so we need to work out, I, I would love it if we could work out something that would be backwardly compatible, and that's gonna be hard, um, but also really, really clear with good conformance tests saying, if you have an attribute value of X, it should end up in an encoded form of Y. And I'm okay for that to sort of then leave RFC 7230, um, which I also find hard to understand, but that's that RFC's problem, not um, not ours. Um, so that everyone can hopefully do the same thing, encode the same way, decode the same way. Is, yeah, does anybody have any questions about the, about the issue that he's raising first? Yeah, so what are the, what are the, the so attribute values? So this attribute value that you're that you're showing here, um, what what attribute would that be in? Is that what is that what is that typed? Uh, well, so this would be presumably a string attribute. The um, if you Doug, if you follow the HTTP, yeah, follow that link and it'll be a bit clearer because it says the HTTP value is constructed from the respective attribute types canonical string representation. So you convert to a string first, yeah. <clears throat> then you do encoding. So I would hope that how you encode wouldn't depend on the attribute type. Um, but, but a, a URI is, so we have a URI type uh, or yeah. URI reference type. And I think, I think we use that specifically for cases where we knew that there would be there would be a URI there and that it needs to needs to have URI treatment. But, but does it, it have URI treatment particularly in terms of encoding it as a header? If we have <clears throat> if we can find some something that says I will take arbitrary string that isn't a control doesn't have control characters, bad surrogate pairs, etc. And encode this appropriately as a header in a way that's reversible, and ideally doesn't make URIs look completely weird. You know, doesn't start encoding slashes and colons. Um, mm -hmm. Then we don't need to give special. Well, if you're encoding an, H an HTTP header and the original attribute was a string, then you do X. If it used to be a URI, then you do Y. And you know, it would be particularly weird. Suppose you had. Um, is subject a string? I think it is. Um, if you mm -hmm. had two uh, 
suppose someone decided to make the source and subject the same string. So one is a URI, one is just a string. If those came out differently in headers, I would personally think that would be a bit odd. Okay. I was just checking to see which things are strings. I think type is probably the most common string aside from ID. So let's focus on type since type can basically be anything you want. Yeah. And of course, extension attributes come here as well. Yes. So any questions first just about the concept of what we're what we're focusing on before we start talking about possible next steps. Okay, I'm going to say Clemens grunt is no. Um, okay, so so John, are you proposing we scrap the RFC thirty nine eighty six encoding rules and and create our own? Yes, which makes me as nervous as it probably makes everyone else on the call. Yeah, it does. Um, <laughs> um, because yeah, I, I want to come up with something that is um, better defined than you than referring to that, but still backwardly compatible with what people have been doing already, ideally. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean the goal. So, so, so the, let's go back to the to, to the HTTP protocol binding spec. Um, so the motivation is in the second paragraph there. Um, yep. I completely agree that we need to do encoding and I'm happy enough with um, percent encoding and thrilled that we've, uh, I'm not sure whether we are specifically saying percent encoding via UTF-8, but let's assume that we are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, then. I completely agree with all of that. It's just, it's not clear to me when when trying to write code for, I've got this string that can contain any arbitrary, nearly any arbitrary Unicode content, what do I encode? Um, reading RFC 20, 7230 section three uh, was not obvious to me what the code that I should write should look like. Um, okay. And trying to use uh, various built-in library functions such as URL encoding. Uh, if I said encode the data, it did one wrong thing. If I said encode the whole thing, it did something else wrong. Um, and fundamentally, because what we're looking at isn't necessarily a URI. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So the URIs are a special are this special case where we care about the URI still being a URI when you have it in the HTTP header, arguably. Um, Jennifer, you made it. You, Jennifer made a comment on, on in the chat. You should feel always feel entitled to speak up. Jennifer, you want to chime in verbally? Uh -oh. I was looking for the unmute. There you uh, go. <laughs> yeah, no, I just didn't want to interrupt. It, it sounds like we're not saying just completely create our own, but maybe it's just forking and m being more clear about it. Yeah. Um, does that does that have the same feels as like completely creating our own rules? Yeah, I, I think that's a good. I think that is is better than creating completely new rules. Certainly, um, and and maybe it is uh, that we're saying here's the we, we do percent encoding, but we're not doing that for the UI, for the UI character set. So yes, uh, well, wait, I, wait, wait, wait. Is it URI character set or is it the printable US ASCII character set? Yes, and maybe, maybe, maybe that. So we we know that we do need to encode percent because otherwise we yes. can't. Yeah. Um, now, if we if we decided the only things we need to encode are percent and anything non ASCII, mm -hmm. um, that that would be a perfectly good starting point. Um, I wonder whether how that fits in with existing implementations. Um, if, if things are expecting other characters to be encoded, and this was where my ignorance uh, meant that I wasn't proposing anything specific. Um, so that doesn't sound like it. That, so what you just said sounds A, reasonable, and B, doesn't sound like an earth-shaking new invention. 
Um, so I'm wondering whether anybody has somewhere already um, invented that before. Um, and, and it might be interested interested to go and hunt around in the in in the relevant related RFCs or whether there is a where there's a coding like that. Well, regardless of that, I, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm more interested in John's other comment about current implementations and whether if we change something, it's going to break something. So let me ask some of the SDK folks on the call. Did any of you guys even notice this paragraph? Who does any encoding at all? Or was John just being incredibly anal? I, it's, it was when I was fixing things and trying to get them working that, that it came. We do have tests for um, non-ASCII characters in attributes. Um, and it was when I started uh, encoding everything with some URL encoding, at which point those tests still passed, but the test that expected URIs to stay uh, unchanged failed. So, okay, wait a minute. I, I want to focus on Slinky and Scott's comment in the chat, because they're saying that things like the Go library automatically handles this. Can you guys elaborate on what you mean by it just works or it, or it handles it? Does that mean it does encoding or it just doesn't seem to be bothered by non-ASCII characters. We don't care. I mean, it just works. And uh, when you receive it on the other side, you see the same thing that you sent. So the library does it transparently. But do you know what the library does with non-printable characters? I honestly don't. <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know the internals of Golan library, but I mean, at least uh, with all the SDKs I work with, I never found such problem because the library handles transparently all of this. And like even in Rust, uh, strings are uh, TF8 by the by default. And I guess this is all already uh, encoded as it should by uh, by default. Would somebody would be willing to check and test out a couple of the SDKs to see what they do if you if you try to give it a non-printable character and see what it does? Like, I mean, does it reject it? Does it skip it? Does it encode it? It would also be just to add a, a second level of burden because it's not just uh, that sort of thing, but typically um, if a header has multiple values, they are comma separated, which means that um, if you want to have a single value that contains a comma, you need to put double quotes around it and, and stuff. So uh, that's where I think a conformance test of, you know, this is the, uh, how does a value of space X space get written on the wire and does it get correctly decoded? What if you have a comma in there, et cetera, as well as um, Unicode? Yeah, just so you know, I just did a quick test with, just for fun, just curl. And I gave it a header with a value of comma, comma, comma. It just passes it through. Now that just could mean the curl is just too low level and it's not even going to try to encode it. It's going to give you, it's going to take whatever you want, but at least from a curl perspective, it doesn't touch it. Yes. I suspect that it expects that you meant multiple values. Yeah. Um, just That's another, awesome. just another data point. Uh, I, I, uh, for, for the Ruby SDK, we actually did have to, um, uh, implement this uh, explicitly. And I do remember going through the process of puzzling out uh, what, what this, these paragraphs mean uh, and, this, and going through several iterations of, of not understanding that before. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's quote unquote correct or at least reasonable now, um, but it's been a little while since I've, I remember it being confusing. So, so what did you do did, with, with things like colon? So yes, we. Uh, I I believe I'm I'm looking at my code right now. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, percent and printable ASCII, uh, or, or yeah, uh, passing you know, per, per, passing through uh, printable ASCII uh, that's not percent and percent encoding the rest. So you did convert up. You did encode the. Uh... The, the, the colon. Yes. Uh, what colon? Uh, I, I'm. Uh, what, what's the ASCII code for colon? 
I don't know. The only reason I ask about that one is because, well, I take comma instead. I, I, I'm not sure what the ASCII code is for that either. Yeah. Uh, but oh, comma is more interesting. Whole other differences because of the whole multiple uh, multiple values thing. Uh, I, uh, um, I, I'm not. I, I don't think we're. I don't think we're handling colon or commas any differently from any other. Uh, right. I think it's also entirely feasible that um, HTTP libraries may may uh, handle commas and quoted strings and things uh, for us, but I don't think they will handle the percent encoding because, as far as I'm aware, that's not part of HTTP. Yeah. So a comma, I think, is forty four decimal. If that helps you, uh, Dave, um, Daniel. Okay, so <laughs> so I'm curious about the next steps here. Um, <clears throat> it sounds like we have at least one SDK that actually did try to follow these rules. Um, I, I so I'd, I'd be curious to know what the other ones do. However, I I think it also may be worthwhile to get a proposal for what this, I guess is what Jennifer said is, you know, forking and, and clarifying a proposal would look like, right? Sort of along the lines of I think we- the, the general idea of encode percent and anything non-ASCII, um, then reluctant as I am to take on a second action item, uh, I can work with Daniel and we can check the, uh, check whether we're in line and our understanding of, um, the RFC and C. You know, it may be that actually an explanatory paragraph explaining how to read RFC 7230 in this case, maybe that's all that's required. Um, it might also be worth saying that when decoding HTTP headers, uh, implementations should probably percent decode everything and expect that some implementations may encode more than they need to. Yeah. Yeah. I I think my head's leaning that way too. Okay, so I think, so the actions here are, um, <laughs> thank you, Scott. Me to go away, talk with Daniel, yeah. um, yeah. which Daniel and I are colleagues, by the way. Uh, hi, Daniel. Uh, so <laughs> hence why I'm very happy to, to get together with him and, and uh, talk this through. Um, yeah. So, so okay. Scott is saying that he can send headers with emojis in Go. That is, that is right. You will send headers that end up being bits on the wire that will then also decode right if you're lucky on the other side but you're still violating the protocol rules unless it is um performing some kind of encoding that in maybe in some bit of rfc that i'm not aware of uh, or is sort of doing an encoding and assuming that things will do the same thing yeah, um, I mean, there, there's a it's it's seven bit ASCII. It's what that's what's allowed in the headers, and yes. um, and the, the the fact that we are putting eight bit ASCII into into those headers practically is 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 still not making it valid. Actually, I, I, I am mistaken. I was making sure that uh, our UTF eight encoding for the uh, the character set for data encoding for the payload worked out. Mm. So we're not putting emoji in the, the header. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a fun test, though. Let's see what happens. Yeah, no, but, but that's 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 the tragic with these with these uh, with that rule. I'm pretty sure that these days um, you can literally go and send HTTP headers that have emojis, and it will work on most stacks because because people just don't think about the constraints, it, or in, at least in some in some of those stacks. So, so maybe that seven bit ask your rule is something that is, um, um, you know, just loosely enforced. And that's why some of that stuff just works. Like, I think, I think if you just use umlauts, so anything from the, the upper, the upper um, um, uh, section of, of ASCII, then, or at the NC strings, that that will largely just work, but it's still that's, illegal. That's it. Uh, no, it's, it's, it, I believe, having recently been reading this, I believe that's 
valid but strongly discouraged these days. There's an OBS <laughs> characters or something <laughs> bit of RFC um, 3986 that says, yeah, you can if you really want, but please don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those HTTP headers are a little weird. Yeah, I think we've got better at writing RFCs than we were back then. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, so I, I believe the net of this is John and Daniel go off and talk and hopefully come back with a proposal or something. Does that sound yeah. fair? Okay. Any other comments about this one then before we move on? Just thank you for indulging me. No, this is good. Just as long as Okay, go ahead. Data point for the node. For the node, we we don't do any real parsing at all. We do we do uh, we'll throw if it's not a string or uh, something that can be converted to JSON. We'll throw an exception. Okay, good to know. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Any other comments? All right. And John, never apologize for doing work. It's all good. All right. Um, okay, this one I thought was interesting. Oh, and Jem's not even here. So, I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody read it. So, this one and this one I think are related. That's why I put them both in the agenda. What should a client do if an entry vanishes from the discovery get response? Okay. And obviously, Jem's question is broader than that. Um, but I, I think the question I had for the group here is, do we want to go beyond saying what happens when something vanishes, but I'm going to, which I actually propose, that we interpret a vanish from a get, meaning it's been deleted. So there is no notion of deprecation or anything like that. Um, or do we want to go as far as what Jem is proposing, which is to actually have real life cycle type values associated with the things. So is it Boolean or multi-steps in terms of removing stuff? I guess is the question. And I wanted to open that up for discussion. No one has any opinion? Okay, I'll put one out there. I'm inclined to close gems. While it's an interesting thing, I think it adds complication to the spec. I would rather just have it vanish if it gets deleted. So it's either there or not there. And keep it simple. I, I Clemens, you, you came off mute. Oh, okay. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with you. And to elaborate a little more, I think part of the reason I think that is because I think the minute you start getting into this stuff, you're going to get into really complicated things like, okay, well, how long does that have to be retired for or deprecated for? And then you have to have timestamps and all this other stuff. And it just, it just seems like it's more trouble than it's worth. And I think actually you could also add this stuff later because I think until something actually vanishes, the fact that it may have a, a state or something like that that we add later on still implies that it's there. So you could technically use it. It's just it's just not recommended, I think is the way I, I would interpret it. So it's that, I don't think it'd be backwards compatible to add some sort of deprecation state later if we wanted to. But anyway, Klaus, your hands up. Yeah, actually I agree too. Uh, I think it's uh, there will be a lot of variations. What this uh, very abstract concept of a service maps to in the specific environments and. So this life cycle will also most likely be handled differently in those environments that would make it really hard to handle it here. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? So I, this may be totally weird to think about, but I, what if it doesn't, what if it's an accident that it doesn't exist? So what if you do a, a follow-up get and then it is there so what what is that handled separately i kind of like that there's a state of the service so if there's an explicit sort of this is going away versus it's it's like it just disappeared 
the, your, your first question is interesting to me because I think that might fall into the same category as, well, what happens if someone fat fingered you know, a URL or one of the other values and it, maybe an hour later they realized it and so they changed it back. It, it, to me, it's the same kind of thing there. It's just, you sent bad data you know, and I'm not sure we necessarily need to go out of our way to protect, to babysit people. Right, so if someone accidentally deletes a service and then, oh, realize they made a mistake and resurrects it an hour later, they may have hurt their clients, but that's what they did, right? They, they changed the data. I don't know, I mean, Jennifer, is that, is that too simplistic? Um, I don't know. It, I that might that might that might be sufficient to say it, but I I feel like I there's always these cases that are like on the edges of like well it's not supposed to do that, um, and so then I try to think of like well it's less about protecting us from making mistakes, but more like uh, being explicit about how things should work in the case of uh, uh, uncertainty. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. So maybe, it, I don't know, like, I, I, I just, I think of it from a um, QA perspective as well, from like, just like weird shit happening and it's just explicit. So I like the idea of, of, of there's a life cycle of a, of a service explicitly. So let's, let's poke on that a little. How far would you want to take this? Meaning, do you, are you proposing that people are not allowed to just make it vanish and delete it immediately? Are they therefore required to go through a deprecation stage? Yeah, I think that's, that, that's the, that, that you're right. That is kind of what it, I'm saying. I think yeah. that's a good way to put it. it what other people like? A little bit like, uh, do you just delete a page from the internet or do you put a redirect in place? to say, oh, well, I know where you meant to go. I'm going to be helpful. Um, we don't necessarily need to require stuff um, in order to say it would be a nice idea and to provide some part of the protocol to be able to say, please don't come here again, or it's gone over there or whatever. Clemens, did you want to say something? You came off mute. Um... Yeah, that was not a completely formed thought when I was unmuted, so um, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> okay, so, so Jennifer, it's interesting. I, I, I'm just obviously just, just my two cents, but I'm, I'm less inclined to force a deprecated state or to enforce a state system, but I, I can be sold on the idea of including an optional attribute that, that has something semantics along the lines of, by the way, this is going to be removed at this date. And people can optionally set it if they want to give a warning to people, but that's that's not quite the same thing as an entire life cycle to me. Does that make any sense? I I, I like I have been convinced now having heard John's uh, sort of way of uh, thinking of it of like oh yeah like we could make it an optional thing, um, and then it's more of something that you could we could have a recommended practice and then it makes it more like people can be more explicit or not. So I I feel like that's where I'm at right now in, in terms of thinking about it. Elaborate optional a, sounds great. Yeah, but elaborate a little. When you say optional, what's optional? The entire life cycle or just one attribute that says something? What, what are the but, semantics well, of this optional? Like an thing? optional state, like if you have the ability to have this optional state where you can add sort of the context that then people, you can, for your own service that you're defining, you are able to set that and be explicit about it. Um, and if we have some way, uh, like I, I keep thinking of like, here's the spec and then here's the implementation and like, or sample implementation um, and recommendation that that feels like it's a space where people can um, leverage different styles, just like not every, some people just delete pages and so, providing redirects. That's why I really like John's way of uh, speaking about it. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> he was shocked that you actually listened to him. Um, okay, anybody else wanna chime in? 
Okay. And not to pick on John. Oh, John Mitchell. Go ahead. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, with all uh, worries about uh, sucking up to Doug, I actually like where you were headed with your comment, Doug. The, the fact that it's uh, you can add extra information into some kind of attribute to give people a heads up that they can look at. Because the, 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 the problem with making this too explicit is the, the, the failure modes around things vanishing, whether it's a, you know, a transient fluttering of the service coming up and down for whatever reasons, like the fat finger examples or whatever, they like all of those are still going to happen, even if you somehow mandate an explicit life cycle. Right. So the, the code pass for people who actually care about the higher quality of service implementations, giving them a heads up and managing, you know, deprecation periods and all those cool things like and, and trying to make that completely um, um, discoverable automatically rather than out of band human things, you still have to deal with those cases where yeah, it just goes away. Right. So the extra complexity in band it doesn't actually buy much in terms of in practice reality dealing with failure modes, or at least all of the failure modes. Does that make sense? Jennifer, any reaction to that? It is the is the culture of not responding uh, verbally. Is that is that okay to be like, oh, that's interesting. Is that no, that's fine. That's fine. And I just <laughs> wanted to give you an opportunity to respond if you had any feedback or wanted to get into a dialogue about it. That's it. I I appreciate it. Um, it there's a lot to think about here. Thank okay. you. No, okay. I I I mean I I I'll, I'll tell you my personal bias when I design protocols like this is. Like I, it, it's all about failure modes to me and life cycles. Like, so all of my systems are basically, you know, some form of finite state machines and those kinds of things. So I totally, I totally agree with the, 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 the intent that you're talking about is just in practice. If, if the, if the hardest failure modes are the ones where it's, uh, it's fluttering and, and transient. Like I can give all sorts of great examples at you know lower network levels where where literally people take weeks to try and discover some of these problems because they they didn't make their system resilient enough. So I agree. I it just doesn't. If the states don't cover it anyway, there's not much for us to do. Okay. So say well, let me do this. Um, so I'm not sensing a. a a broad consensus yet. And as Jennifer said, she wants to think about it. I think other people need to think about it as well. So there's no decision on here. We'll save this again for next week and maybe we, people will do some more thinking about it. Um, but we did have some interesting options mentioned. So let's just hold off on, on making a decision on either this one or the next one because I think um, they're both very much related. Um, so let's hold off on that, but think about it during the week. Um, and Jennifer, I, I just so you know, I just get so excited when people speak up because a lot of times the people in the group get very quiet on these calls. So I just get excited that somebody chooses to speak up. So you did and I jumped on it. So I'm like, I encourage it. So I didn't mind to pick on you. Um, no, okay. no, no, I did not. I did not perceive <laughs> it as picking at all. I was just like, I was like, oh, okay. I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> but I do want to say like, um, I'm relatively new to this particular community of folks. Uh, I didn't realize it existed until recently. And I just want to say it like, it's so fabulous. I love, um, I've been here, I guess, like three weeks or something. And like the the style of how y'all run the meeting and um, it's so collaborative. Uh, I really think it's great. So thank you. Yeah, we, we got some good folks here. So it's, it's all been good. All right. In that case, anything else on these two topics? As I said, um, <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I, I, even if we come up with a different system, Scott, I'm going to keep doing roll call just to annoy the crap out of you. Um, okay, so anything else on these two topics before we move forward? Okay. Does, oh, Slinky, since you're on the call now, was there anything you wanted to mention about the SQL query expression? Since you weren't here, we, we didn't really talk much about it other than to say that 
Um, I noticed there was some activity today going on, so I thought it might be premature to try to merge it, but that I'm hoping by next week we might be able to merge it because the amount of traffic will have slowed down and that it's a it's probably good enough as a first rough draft to go in, but I want to give you an opportunity to speak to it if you wanted to. No, I'm fine with it. Uh, there, there is some comment from uh, Lionel that I want to fix, uh, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, people, please resolve conversations. <laughs> so I know what else I need to do. Okay. Uh, okay, hold on a minute. I might realize I jumped the gun on these notes. Okay, cool. All right, are there any other um, of these PRs that we need to talk about? Slinky, you may have been doing some changes, or maybe, I'm sorry, that was Clemens. I think Clemens made some changes recently today. Obviously, it's too soon to merge, uh, but please people take a look at that when you get a chance, because I think they're going to make some changes recently. All right, any other topics people want to bring up? All right, in that case, in the five minutes we have remaining, we'll do Scott's favorite thing. Clemens already talked. Um, Matt, are you there? Yep. All right, and Vlad? I am here. Hey, Doug. Hey, hey Vlad. And Grant? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. All right, did I miss anybody for a roll call? I think I got everybody. All right, in that case, we are done. Um, actually, before, before we go, does anybody have any topic for the discovery interrupt call? Otherwise, we'll just say we're done for the day completely. Anybody want to bring anything up? All right, not hearing anything. All right, get back an hour of the, of the day. All right, thanks everybody for calling or for joining in. It's been a good, good call. Talk to you next week. Thanks, Doug. Okay, thanks, Bye, everybody. Cheers. All the best.